This shenanigans episode has been like four years in the making. I'm so excited to finally be sitting here in studio across from my girl, Dana Kathan. Oh my God. I feel like, is it like James Cameron? I feel like this is Avatar 3. Like right? it's really been that much of yeah. a build up. But hi, how hi. are you? Hi, good. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Literally, we've talked about this since we met and had our ups and downs. And I know at the time we weren't able to do one and then pandemic and uh, everything in between, but... Okay, I think timing is everything, though, mm -hmm. so I'm actually glad that this didn't happen before. Yeah. And I'm glad it happened now, personally. I don't know how you feel about that. No, but. I agree. I was literally this morning listening again to your episode on The Balanced Blonde with Jordan, and there were so many things you said in that episode that when I listened to it before she did my podcast, I was like, oh my God, I need to get Dana on mine because there are just so many things you said mental health that I can relate to that I want to get into but well I'm excited to talk about it because yeah. you and I have a little bit offline so like there are things that I didn't know that we connected on even mm -hmm. in some of that stuff that I talked about with Jordan so yeah very excited to chat about it before we get into all things mental health I would like to talk about our weekend our weekend together and what you did yesterday so I mean probably the best weekend I've ever had <laughs> I mean emo night in general let's first start with first of all you killed it thank and you your new ver version of good as gold like absolutely on repeat we oh. love to see it how much fun was that recording that so and also, how much that, fun you didn't tell me how did that come to be so uh, there's a cover of since you've been gone that the band a day to remember did and when Katie, Ariana, and I had our first Emo Night DJ thing. I remember, in we, April. Yeah, we opened up with that song. And as I was listening to that version, I just had a thought, what if we did a cover of Good As Gold, you know, a pop, punk, emo, screamo type version of the song? And I asked TJ, who runs Emo Night, if he knew a band who would be down and not, you know, cost me an arm and a leg. And he was like, yeah, I have some people in mind. And then he told me about this band called The 27s. I went on their Instagram. I was like, okay, first of all, love their vibe. They are so dope. And I love their sound. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, they can get it done this weekend. I was like, whoa, whoa, like this weekend? And so I was like, all right, fuck it. Let's do it. So they recorded their part. And then I went into the studio and recorded my part. And then after performing it live, I'm like, hold on. Can I be the Fergie to your 27? So literally, it's. I mean, also, I feel like so taking it back because I think it was April when when the first you guys first did your email because yes, that it was, was. When, that was actually surprisingly the first emo night of my life. Although I had been wanting to do them, yeah, that is where we deeply fell back in love. I would say, yeah, like that was like such a that also totally. I, I like cry when I think about that night. Not just because everyone like it was just the best energy, the best group. Everyone really wanted to be there, and it yeah. was just like heaven on earth for me. No, it like, was, was so much Disney. fun. I yeah. love it. I feel like we first reconnected back at Ocean's birthday party mm -hmm. last year. That's when we kind of refollowed each other and we're like, okay, mm -hmm. we're cool. All the past shit aside, but we weren't really hanging out yet and we didn't fully reconnect. But April emo night, and Coachella. We had so we had back to backs <laughs> because it was like emo night and Coachella, which yeah. were both two of the best things that had happened to me in a really long time. So I thought, we just, let's just keep these good vibes going. Yes, and like that totally. TikTok noise. So yeah. Emo night this time was amazing. You guys killed it. And like, I don't know. I just, anyone who was emo in middle school or high school who was an outcast fully understands when people are there, like most of those people had that shared experience mm -hmm. and were probably tormented. I know you were bullied a lot. I was yeah. bullied a lot. So when you're there, you're just collectively with a group of people who are able to be their most authentic selves and be like, this is fucking cool. I told you yeah. goddamn losers who are working wherever the fuck you're working, doing right? nothing with your lives now, who are the <laughs> ones that were bullying growing up. Yeah. And it's just like the most pure form of just ecstasy. I mean, and I love the mosh pit. Yeah, Obviously, I'll never I know. Shut up about you it, were so. literally in it. In the mosh pit, like really in it. I remember the first one. I remember looking at you. We were like out back with everyone. I looked at you and no one was like wanting to do it. And I was like, I want to mosh. And you were like, <laughs> you guys, Dana's going to mosh. We're going to go support. So you yeah. guys were all very supportive. Yeah, I stood back a little <laughs> bit and like protect my veneers. And I mean, you need to protect your nose. My, my nose and my <laughs> veneers now since I've like literally, I, I said that. I was like, if I break my nose over this, I'm going to be so mad. But right? like it was a good time. Yeah. So nothing. And I should probably quit while I'm ahead. But it was, so maybe it was my 
grand finale moshing performance, but I love it. Maybe. Yeah, definitely be careful because they go at it. I mean. And it's really slippery. I don't remember that growing up It make because everyone's drinking, so they're throwing their right. drinks around. So you're literally like, it's it feels like an ice skating ring. So dangerous. And That's how I broke my teeth. <laughs> I thought it was not a mosh pit, but a wet Florida bar. That's what I was gonna. Well, I remember mm-hmm. you saying something about like it was like a giraffe on skates or some shit, yes. and that's that's how it felt. That's so, how I looked. Mm-hmm. So let's we're gonna take our blessings. Protect. and My nose costs a lot of money. So yes, gotta keep it totally. Going. Well, it looks amazing. Thank but you. <laughs> I will say, I feel like emo night is something that brought not just you and I back together, but also me and Katie. I know you guys are so close, and it is amazing how you know music and something like emo night can just really reconnect people who had had a falling out. So I love that it was able to do that for all of us. I love that too, and yeah, Katie's the best, and also she, I like, we've always connected on that that music specifically mm-hmm. too, and I just know how much happiness it brought her and you guys like it's just so fun to watch you i mean the first time we were like back behind when it was happening and then i was in the crowd because we got there late this time and it was like so fun to watch and the people around us were losing their fucking minds so because i was saying when you were up there i wasn't sure you could because we had just gotten there like even see us and we're like Mm -hmm. in all these people but everyone around us was freaking the fuck out like they loved it oh good so you guys i know we're like do do they like this we're just up there living our best life and we're like i think they like it they liked it and i saw a group of girls right when i got on the mic so we definitely need to work on our dj skills like when someone's gonna get on the mic when we turn the sound down when we're gonna switch songs because we were a little Rusty, it had been a couple months and we did not do sound check. We just got up there and we're like, yeah, fuck it. We'll just, you know, <laughs> free for all. And there was one part when I went to switch and I was like, oh shit, that turns it off. But everyone thought I meant to do that. And I was like, yeah, totally meant to do that. But right when I got on the mic, I was going to introduce my new song and then Ariana or Katie hit play. And so, and so then I'm like screaming over to try and introduce the song and the band. I wanted to give them a shout out yeah. without the music playing. So I saw videos and you could actually hear what I was saying. Thankfully up there, I couldn't hear shit, but I guess it did project. And I saw a group of girls who were right in front of the mosh pit. Right when I said good as gold, they all freaked out. And I was like, okay, good. We do have some true fans here. And they were so excited. No, people were losing it. And also, do you know what I saw on Instagram today? What? Emo night, August 4th, I think. They're doing it in August 9th or something. Yeah, it's the first Friday of every month. Wait, I thought that it wasn't. I thought it was every other month in L.A. or something like that. No, first Friday of every month. And then two weeks past the first Friday is in San Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of time is what I have to say about that. So you guys iron it out and then go back again. Yeah. So I had so much fun doing that that I'm actually going back to the studio next week with the band and we're going to record some more stuff together. Shut up. Yeah. New songs? or Yeah, we're going to do new and then I'm actually going to put some more vocals on the Good as Gold one because it sounded so good. I didn't want to fuck it up. So I was like, no, no, no. I'll just do the bridge, my little rap part. But then when I went upstairs to Bardot and actually performed it live with them, they're like, no, come out for the whole song. And I'm like, okay, again, didn't have sound check didn't rehearse practice sing with them at all other than in the studio yeah once twice i guess we did two sessions when we recorded it but when i got up there i'm like all right i guess i'm just gonna scream some parts sing some parts and i'm like maybe i should put a little more vocals on it so yeah. if we do perform this live again then we can do it together well sounds but, like you're going to yeah and they're like when are we going on tour i was like wait are you guys being serious are you fucking with me right now because that is actually my musical dream i am the first one to say i'm not a great singer but i can scream i can rap i can perform and put on a good show are you going on warp tour and you didn't tell me you know wow. we're, it's it's in the making so we're gonna get back in the studio yep. and yeah i'm like that's that's always been the dream if i could be like a gwen stefani fergie have all my boys behind me how fucking fun would that be iconic yeah. i mean you looked good with them on friday so thanks like see it again yeah can't wait okay so back to you that started our weekend it did but epic start to the weekend can we talk about yesterday how your weekend ended um yeah my weekend <laughs> ended i would say it was a little more dangerous than the mosh pit mm-hmm. i did some diving i got like i mean over the last few years i've really ticked off many of the things that i were lifelong dreams and things that i wanted to do so last year i got scuba certified in cozumel which i know that you love which oh, was yes. funny. another thing i didn't know we had in common so you had been there yeah um the water there as you know super clear crystal clear Warm, gorgeous go- beautiful reefs and for people who do want to dive like it's a great diving location mm-hmm. so it was a great place to get certified hadn't done it since then so catalina um is fucking freezing <laughs> <A little> different. <laughs> it's very dark waters there's not reefs like there's like a cool kelp forest to like fish to see but it also has a huge great white shark population which 
I, in a controlled environment, like to see great white sharks, but definitely not in an environment where there's no cage. So yeah, um, did that. It shocked me how cold it was. Like I had a really thick wetsuit on and like a hood and everything. How and cold are we talking? I think her dive computer said the coldest part of the dive was like 60 degrees, which, oh. which doesn't sound that cold, but like I feel like maybe that was at, at the top because so when you go... But still to be submerged because our ice bath right now is set at 53, Yeah, but we're not moving in yeah. it, you know? So. And, and how long are you in it for? Three minutes? Three to five, yeah. Five, five, yeah, we're down for like an hour. So it's, so it's a different thing oh, too. Yeah. So it's like the wetsuit doesn't keep you super warm. So no. I had my first like panic episode that happened oh during it and I'm usually... I always say like diving is so meditative for me and I go somewhere else and like I'm able to stay calm but like I get now how shit goes down so got through it made it to the surface and was like okay I'm done diving in rough conditions so mm -hmm. I'm sticking to like Hawaii the Bahamas yeah Cozumel, more Cozumel. yeah places like that yeah so I had a pretty big weekend oh and by the way when we were first booking this trip my friend who I went great white shark diving with is who I went diving with yesterday uh -huh. She originally wanted to do it on Saturday, and I looked at my calendar, and I was like, ooh, we have emo night on Friday. Yeah. So I'm not going to be doing anything on Saturday, and I'm really glad that happened because I was not able to get out of bed because I'm not a 13-year-old teeny bopper anymore <laughs> that can jump around. So I was, like, down for the count all day Saturday. So I know, right? at least, bless, I did the right day. Yeah, but well worth it. Well worth it. Yeah. Excellent weekend had by all. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do it again. August... September. We, we just want to keep it going. That was the thing. I'm like, do you guys want to actually take this seriously? Make a DJ name for ourselves? Maybe do some of the other cities? Because I just think that would be so fun. Um, also, yeah, I want to go to all be your yeah. little groupie. I fucking Perfect. take get me to emo night in the country. Yeah. Immediately, yes. And T I love TJ. He's so wonderful. So I know. want to support them in any way I can. Yeah. Oh, it, it was so fun. Like, I think that I know you said the first emo night was one of the best nights of your life. But this one, too, for me, I was like, this was literally in my top life moments. And the 27s, I just got to give another shout out to them because they are incredible. Performing live, Lando, the singer who also screams. I'm like, how do you do both? Is he I mean, the one that came up on the thing with you yeah. at the main? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, he was amazing. Yeah, and then Kevin plays guitar. And then I think uh, Jake and Gavin, who are also in the band, I feel like they're maybe not always, they don't always play with them. But those guys are all... So dope. I so. have a, I have a quick can't wait. I have a quick bone to pick with Brock because I was standing next to him when this was happening, and uh -huh. right before the song come, he's like, "Oh my god, when the song comes on, I'm going to mosh." Because I had just like like some forty one came out or something, so I just yeah. went out and I came back and I was like, "Okay, great, then we're gonna do that." Because obviously no one else would do it. And the song came on. I looked at him and like he looked back at the pit and was like. No, never mind. <laughs> Just yeah. like kept taking videos of you. I think Brock worries that he's too big of a guy. And if he were to mosh and like someone were to get hurt, you know, then it's like, oh, the big guy beat me up sort of thing, even though it's a mosh pit. A possibility. But he definitely worries about that. So as much as it sounded fun in theory, when he actually thinks about it, he's like, I am too big of a person. I can't do that. I mean, it was probably for the best, and I was yeah. already, like, not in that state of mind. That was no longer the brain I was yeah. working with. I was like, let's just get in there. So Yeah, totally. All right, we're going to take a quick little break, and then we'll be right back. All right, Factor Fridays. What's on the menu tonight, honey? We've got turkey chillin' and zucchini. Chillin'? <laughs> Chili. <laughs> <laughs> we chillin'. What do we got in the fridge for me? What do you want, honey? We've got... I was thinking something maybe with lemon... Oh, well, perfect. Got this one. Are we in luck? Curry, lemon, pepper, chicken. Well, it's not curry, it's creamy, but oh. sound of that is my dinner, which will be ready in only two minutes. They come delivered straight to my door. What's oh, yours, honey? This is so good, guys. And the fun fact is, sauce on the side because there's that much flavor in there already. So, get lean, baby. Yeah. important because I got to tell you guys since becoming a mom I receive a lot of unsolicited mom advice and it's like listen if you're out here on the internet trolling telling people how they should live their life and parent let me give you a little bit of advice can you say mind your business yeah and stay hydrated because that's at least what I'm going to try and do this summer Mm-hmm. And you know what? Ah, it tastes refreshing. 
This episode of Shenanigans is brought to you by Poise Ultra Thins. So I am in love with being a mom, but it's also really important to me, as you guys know on this podcast, to just be transparent and be open about my experiences with motherhood. I think that is just a huge part of life is sharing experiences and just talking about the things we go to as mothers. So if we're keeping it real about postpartum life, one thing we're not talking about is bladder leaks. A lot of women use period pads for their bladder leaks, especially after having a baby. But let's be honest, period pads aren't designed for pee. Poise Ultra Thins, on the other hand, are... So, you guys, I'm telling you, Poise Ultra Thins are the brand's thinnest protection that keep you clean, dry, and fresh throughout the day while you spend time on your precious little ones. They offer with and without wings, and they will stay in place all day. So, if I know I'm going to be out jumping up and down on a bar, performing, or doing anything that just requires a little extra movement, Poise Ultra Thins is my way to go. These little moments are really just so important, and Poise Ultra Thins are such a good way to enjoy motherhood without compromise. It takes poise. Learn more at poise.com. All right, so I posted for questions, and obviously the top question is, why didn't you come back to Vanderpump Rules? I had, I'm not kidding you, hundreds of people ask that. Hundreds of people said they want to see you back. Will they see you back? Obviously, I know the reasons and everything that happened, but for the shenanigans listeners, can you give some insight into why you were only on for season eight? Yeah, so it's kind of a intricate answer. Like, there's multiple things to it, but the long and short of it is COVID happened, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, timing is everything, and the world became really different. Like, the season I was on started airing in January of 2020. So, by March of that time, all of a sudden, the whole world stopped and wasn't really sure what was going to happen. The show went on hi- hiatus, so that that summer of 2020, filming didn't end up happening. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of just like a waiting game of deciding what was going to happen. Now, mind you, there were a lot of other things in my personal life going on. And, you know, even when you and I had beef or anyone else on the show that I didn't particularly like or whatever, I always said I gave so much props and kudos to every single person who not only does Vanderpump Rules, but any reality show, because when you're inside of it and you get to see how difficult it is, like, it kind of sounds like a cliche, right? Someone's like, oh, I'm on TV, it's hard, but like it is really hard Mm -hmm. and it is extremely mentally taxing and it's extremely difficult for someone who has mental health issues to Mm -hmm. navigate those when you're dealing with a constant source of contention and you're always having all these little stressors and triggers around you. So for me personally, I was working in healthcare sales, which is what I'm still doing now. Like I had no intentions on being on television. I did not come to LA being like, I'm going to, I want to be on a reality TV show. That was not it. It truly found me. Yeah. And so I ended up going with it though, because I was like doing stand up comedy at the time. And I had been doing this really serious healthcare sales career my whole adult life. And I had a lot of friends that got to do gap years, like after college and, you know, do fuck around and travel and do fun things. But because of circumstances in my personal life that happened to me right when I graduated, I just, I had to be really serious. And so Mm -hmm. I never like thought like, what's fun to you? What do you want to do? What, you know, in terms of life experience and whatever. So I just kind of jumped into this career track. So when the show did become available to me and I was doing stand up by that point, I think I was 28. I was like, what else is there? Like, is this all it's ever going to be for me that I'm just doing this very nine to five corporate job, never really done anything else, or should I take a chance and do the show? So I ended up doing it, but in doing that, I lost the job that I had been doing. And at that time, I also lost my health insurance because of it, mm-hmm. which is, don't get me started on healthcare oh, in America. No, no. I, I know. So when that happened, I was feeling really good because there are parts of it that are really exciting, right? Like people do it for a reason. There's huge opportunities that come from it. It's very fun. Also, I'm a Leo. I will literally be the first person to be like, I love being the center of attention. Like I love being (laughs) on TV. I loved it when I was getting recognized. It was cool and fun and exciting. And so, and also for me, when I was doing stand up at the time, it was good for that. And there was just multiple things that created this bubble that like 
hid from me how not well I was doing in a lot of other ways. So when I lost my health insurance, I went off my antidepressants and um, medication, which was a very not smart thing for someone like me to do. I've been on them, I think since I was 21, and I had only gone off them one other time in my life. And the problem with medication, when it's working, you feel good and normal. Mm -hmm. So like, I was like, you know, it's been a few years, I'm in a different place, this will be fine. So I just quietly tapered off my medication and didn't tell anyone in my life because I was just like, this is gonna be fine. Terrible, terrible, wrong decision. Mm -hmm. So I go off my medication, the pandemic happens, we i'm very isolated i was single at the time so i anyone who was single like had this experience like there were literally two months when i was just at home 24 7 with nothing to do feeling very unsure and very alone so as that continued on and the show seemed farther and farther out i looked at my life and i've been working since i mean when i say i had jo like odd jobs when i was like an 11 year old 12 year old that's not an exaggeration i've worked my entire life had my first real job when I was 15 and I've never had that stillness mm -hmm. of not having work. And when everything happened with my mom and my life kind of fell apart, I very much put my self-worth and self-esteem into my job because I was good at it. So it was like, okay, this is a metric in which I'm performing and like, obviously I'm successful. People think I'm successful because I'm good at this job and I have have this hard career where I'm working with a bunch of like older men and I'm competing with them. So it made me feel good. And then in that stillness, it was like, oh, you just ruined your entire life and everything you've worked for to be on a reality show for a year that mentally kicked your ass. And mm -hmm. what do you have left to live for at this point? So it was just like a perfect storm of things. So when I really reevaluated, I decided to start looking for jobs in my chosen industry and got back into that. And then I, that was December of 2020 when I was talking to Bravo and Evolution if I was going to come back. And I was just like, I can't do this. Like, and also anyone who starts out in reality TV, people are like, oh, you make all this money. They don't pay you anything. <laughs> yeah. you, you get paid nothing starting out because it's basically like earn your keep, like mm -hmm. show that you have worth, that you add value to the show, which I kind of get, but they pay you nothing. So they basically wanted me to come back again, not making anything. And I'm like, look, I'm not being a diva. I burned through my entire life savings during COVID and I've been unemployed trying to find work for a year. I can't just keep doing this and then it's still months out from when we're even filming where I'm like, I have like a month's left of rent. And coming from a childhood I came from that was nothing but financial insecurity, that was also really traumatizing and triggering for me because I've made it my business to distance myself from having no financial stability. And that's why I chose to work the way I did and the, the path I did in terms of career. And it was just like such an ugly, scary feeling all around. So I was basically like, okay, I'm taking this job. So I took that job and then going into 2021, I was just like in such bad shape emotionally and just had to make the decision to get better. And I was like, you can't keep doing this cycle of every few years of having these big breakdowns mm -hmm. and eventually you're not gonna come back from it. So like, this is your choice. Take this job, start making all these small changes and be happy, like find real happiness for the first time ever or sink. Like, what are you gonna do? And so that's what I chose. Yeah. And going back to the show would not have allowed for that. No, for sure. I mean, especially when you do work a full time, you know, corporate job, this show, it it's just so opposite. So opposite. I mean, mind you, I regret nothing. And it's funny because when COVID happened, I felt really resentful of obviously I didn't die. So I had a much easier COVID than a lot of people like mm -hmm. that was such a hard time for everyone. But I was like. I took this chance, this is bullshit, this ruined my life, but I'm so grateful that something got in the way of me going back to the show because season eight went relatively well for me. Like I could have gone back, I would have been, you know, pursuing, continuing, getting farther and deeper into everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm, if I hadn't had a circumstance to stop that, I would have. And mm -hmm. like, I'm so, so glad I did it because I, I have no idea where the fuck I'd be right now if I had just jumped back into that and continued down the path that I was on. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's not an easy world to be in, you know. Season eight for me was one of the most challenging seasons because I felt like here I am, the only person pretty much still working in this restaurant. I'm bridging all of these new people with the original people 
while still not getting to show anything in my career outside of this show. You know, I have a podcast, I do YouTube, I do all of the, or well, at the time I wasn't doing YouTube, but there were so many things that I had done that never got featured. And I felt like that was kind of where I had a disconnect with you that was so unfair to you because it had nothing to ever do with you. And one day when I write a book, I really want to go into more detail about this because I felt like it was so unfair that I didn't give you a fair chance because I was jealous that you came on the show your first season and boom, everyone's going to Dana's stand-up comedy shows and everyone's supporting Dana's comedy career. And I'm like, what about my podcast? What about my show I did in Vegas? What totally. about anything that I've done? But it made it so right off the bat I had something against you and that was not your fault whatsoever. And then it came across like, oh, you're jealous because she's dating your ex. And I'm like, first of all, it was a guy I banged for like a month. Okay, LOL. not my ex. LOL. <laughs> saw him yesterday, by the way. Um, I saw him two days ago walking into a CVS. <laughs> How random is that? I was literally going in to get a, like anti-nausea medicine for my dive. And I walked in and was like, oh, hi. Hello. The most random thing ever. Yeah. But, and you know, now we can all be friends again. And the past is Truly. the past. But I know that I have apologized to you before, but I just want to say it again that I'm so sorry I didn't give you a fair chance. And I feel like we could have had such a stronger friendship from the beginning if I was open to receiving you on the show. Totally. I and I mean, and you don't thank you. You don't have to say that. But like, I think that you you did get a very unfair shakedown in that whole situation, but so did I. It was just like a perfect storm of, mm -hmm. of a situation that was never going to work or be conducive because of those outside factors. And also, people, maybe they get it by now, maybe they don't. You don't see so much of what is going on behind the scenes. There's fourth wall shit that happens. So mm -hmm. all these other factors, it's, it looks very different when it's on TV than what is actually happening. It's like the tip of the iceberg versus the entire iceberg. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's too soon because all the Titanic TikTok right now. But like... <laughs> You know, it's there's so much more happening than the very small amount you get to see on an hour a week yeah. of like what's actually going on. So, yeah, I mean, that was a shit storm. And also, I look back, that version of myself is like, it's hard for me to watch. I actually haven't watched it since it aired. Like, oh, I, same. I, I don't think I'll probably <laughs> no, ever. I don't go back and watch anything. <laughs> when, I, when I meet new people in my life and they find out I was on the show, I'm like, just don't watch it. And if you yeah. like, if you have to, I would watch it with you. But please just don't because it's not a fair representation of who I am. Like, totally. I mean, that's like I've had like five software updates since I was on that show. So like just me as a person and the amount of growth that I've had. Mm -hmm. But also some of the way that things ha happened for me on the show was my fault. Like, I was just so insecure I was so sad. I didn't understand my attachment style. And again, people will, I sound like a broken record if you've heard me on other podcasts, but I talk about it incessantly because it's so important. It changed my life. Like learning my attachment style, understanding some other issues I had in terms of what mental illness is for me and how it presents. And like, I was just a sad handwritten book and I was trying to fill the void with people that didn't give a fuck about me and things that weren't in my best interest. And I, forgive that version of myself because I couldn't be who I am today which I truly love who I am and like I'm very happy with where I'm at and it couldn't have happened if I didn't go through that really ugly learning experience but mm -hmm. like I regret nothing good I love you know? that yeah that was going to be one of my questions is what do you think was the most positive that came out of it and did you have any regrets no, I mean, I think uh, I would say saying saying Lisa Vanderpump has a fat pussy is probably the only thing that I regret. <laughs> Lisa, if you hear this, I'm sorry. I was drunk. You know, it's so funny that they didn't show for we were wasted. And I had literally two drinks that night. And I yeah. I'm you've partied with me a ton. Like, I'm yeah. never a sloppy person. But when I saw the second that I saw that scene, I was like, oh, my God, Ooh. I was so drunk. <laughs> so I just said something stupid. So that's probably like the only thing I regret. But other than that, no, like. I, I really do feel like I was authentically myself, at least who I was at that time. And I really, that's what I wanted to do was just like, see if it made sense for me to be involved, but I wasn't going to change anything. Like I don't change myself or who's in the room or what the situation is or whatever. So I'm proud of that. I think that it does show, but also, yeah, like it was such an interesting life experience that I got to have. How could I regret that? Mm -hmm. And, and even like the hard stuff makes us who we are so I I fully embrace it I think it's a super funny story in my life now and like you know going into what you guys are filming at the moment there have definitely been times and conversations I've had and considerations about like would it make more sense now just because I'm in such a different place mm -hmm. and whatever but ultimately it's just every single time I came back to the same thing which is just like 
things are too good for me right now and I really like where I'm at and I want to leave it as this very weird chapter yeah. in my life. And now it's just like a weird story. Right. No, I totally get that. It's definitely a crazy world. It's not for everyone, but I'm so thankful that you were a part of it because, you know, now you're in our lives. So we wouldn't have had that without that crazy experience. Totally. And beyond the the growth and the things that it showed you, because it does, you really, it's hard to look away when it's like, oh, that's on camera. No, I said and did those things. Mm-hmm. The relationships that I got out of it, I think is the main reason I was meant to do it. Yeah. Like I, I would do it again a thousand times to have the people I have in my life because of it. So it's like, how could you regret that? Totally. So would you ever do a different type of television show, reality or scripted or anything else in like entertainment? I would say never say never because I've said things that I would like, I would never do that. And then I ended up doing it, but probably not. I would say I'd be more open to or amenable to doing something that allowed me to be myself because like to be on the show it's like they made me work at a restaurant Mm -hmm. and I wasn't a server like that wasn't it was just what made sense to introduce me to these group of people and I get that but I wouldn't do anything where I had to change anything about my life so I would say anything is possible but probably not yeah I want to I want to be a business owner at some point I'm not totally sure what that looks like but I just very much I like what I'm doing right now I look forward to continuing to grow my career and just take over in that way I love that We're going to take another quick little break, and then I really want to get into mental health. Let's do it. Be right back. Awesome. I think I separated that pretty well. I think you did, too. I think it's flowing. Okay. Okay, so as I told you earlier, I was re-listening to your episode on The Balanced Blonde, and there were just so many things going back to even your childhood one thing that you said that super spoke to me and it's something that I've spoken about with my mom is never having the news on at home I am someone who grew up watching the news my mom loves to watch the news every morning every evening and I have told her when you're watching my daughter There is no news on TV, unless it's like daily pop or something, no news. I do not want her to grow up watching that. But honestly, had I not heard you say that on the podcast, it might have taken so many times of me realizing that the news was on in the background and, you know, summer's only two. But I do think there is something about that that can stick with them. And I feel like a lot of my fears definitely came from seeing so much at such a young age so when I heard you say that I was like oh my god a light went off in my brain and I literally immediately told my mom I was like make sure you never have the news on around her so it is so it's funny that that is something that stuck out to you so it's it has it's a it has a clinical name it's called mean world syndrome so I learned about this in college and I had obviously already been way overexposed and it's basically like things that are on the news are on the news because they're rare and noteworthy. Mm -hmm. So, but when you are constantly overexposed to it, it becomes your reality of you thinking that all these horrible things that happen are just around you all the time. And it's not to say that they aren't, but they're not in as big of volume as you think. So for me, it wasn't just news to my parents too. It was religious about the news, but they also watched Dateline 2020. Um, 48 hours CSI my parents let us watch CSI when we were little same all of that okay so when you're a a child and you're just watching that constantly and you you're you're trying to develop your sense of safety and what's normal and what isn't that really really fucked with me and Mm -hmm. like I can't remember what I talked about on Jordan specifically but there was a horrible movie that my mom had us watch and my mom I love her everyone knows that I love my mom she was an incredible mom she did it out of trying to keep us safe like Mm -hmm. she wanted us to know i didn't grow up in a great neighborhood so she was it it came from the right place but it was the wrong execution and if my mom was here today we would laugh about it and she would apologize and i would know she knew that she fucked up but she Mm -hmm. she showed me this horrible opening to this movie this really violent thing it was like five minutes long and she told i remember it so distinctly i remember like the universal picture coming up and my dad being like julie i don't we know i don't want to have them watch this and she was like no they need to know so they show us this five minutes of the most graphic thing I'm not even going to get into. And she pauses it and she's like, girls, if you open the door when mommy and daddy aren't home, this is what will happen to you. And we were going to bed. And she was literally like, good night. Oh Put God. us in. So mind you, 
again, not talking shit about my mom. I love her. I know that she didn't mean anything by it, but like that's kind of how it started. And then it was, I was just always by her side watching TV. So anything that she was watching, I was watching. Mm -hmm. And I am so passionate about this now because I am such a hyper paranoid person. It has contributed to a lot of difficulties for me in my life. And especially with like times I don't feel safe and just being just overly hyper or like aware, like my fight or flight is crazy. Mm -hmm. I know it comes from that. So now with my niece, Lenny, like it was the same thing. Like obviously my mom, my sister is just like the most incredible mom and not that she would like let her be exposed to this ever, but I'm like so passionate about it. Never, Mm -hmm. even if they're in the other room, we're constantly ingesting things through osmosis. It's not just what you're, you're eating. It's like, what are you listening to? Who, whose words are you consuming? Like the relationships you have, what are you, what are you reading? Things like that. I think it's all connected. And for little kids, it's like, I, you want to you don't want to make them naive there's obviously a balance of making sure that they understand how to keep themselves safe you keep them safe but like they don't need to be watching all of that mm-hmm. by any means and there are long-term implications that i'm not say saying everyone will turn out to be a paranoid freak like i am but like for my brain chemistry it was just like a perfect storm of what should not have happened yeah no i feel the exact same way and i've had conversations with my mom recently like very open conversations that have been hard because i never want to hurt her feelings or offend her and she's like well it just sounds like you're blaming me for it i was like no 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 mom i am not blaming you i think you did the best job you could do Mm -hmm. and you always wanted the best for me However, I'm now letting you know that things I'm realizing through therapy that happened when I was so young. And yes, I do think the news and being exposed to all of that at such a young age is one of the things where all of my fears come from. I have recently gotten on Zoloft. I know I told you I'm on, I think, week three now. And it has made a world of difference. I think originally when I got on it, it was a placebo because it's not like it works the first day. No. But... Just knowing that I'm finally, after having a baby, putting my mental health first and getting on something that I was afraid to get on because, you know, there's such a stigma around Western medicine and prescription drugs and being on stuff for life. And I didn't know if that was the path I wanted to go. But the last three weeks that I've not had a sip of alcohol, I've not smoked weed, I've been taking my medication every day, I just feel more at ease. I feel like the intrusive thoughts have gotten less. I feel like I'm not thinking every single thing is life or death. Mm -hmm. Every day when I would put Summer down for her nap or I put her to bed at night, I would just like be crying. And thankfully the room was dark at night, not during the nap time. But I'm just thinking, oh my God, is she going to grow up one day without a mom? Is you know, they're going to be a day where I don't have a daughter. And there's just all of these crazy intrusive thoughts every single day that are slowly getting less and less. And so I'm like, okay, you know what? I know I did make the right decision getting on this. And maybe I'm on it for six months. Maybe I'm on it for six years. Maybe I'm on it forever. But I do know that talking about it has definitely helped being able to relate to people like you who also found out more recently that you have OCD as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm very happy for you. And I think that that's a brave, selfless choice also for your daughter, because you being in your best condition, your best self is what is best for your kids anyway. So Mm -hmm. like that is an amazing choice. I have such well, this podcast is only going to be an hour, but I have such strong opinion. I can talk about this forever. The stigma around Western medicine medication in this country is really bothersome to me. It's also really dangerous. I think that people, yes, it is. Are we over medicated in general? Of course. But there are a lot of people that need these medications and a lot of people that could benefit from them that because of these stigmas and issues, maybe won't pursue it. And for me, it was life changing. It is a hard pill to swallow get it we're talking <laughs> about medication. <laughs> you know thinking you'll be on these medications forever but in the 10 years 11 years that i've been on them the two times i've gone off it i've that was part of it, it was like am i going to be on this forever i know i will be on these medications forever but guess what i'm fine with that that is a part of my day-to-day these medications don't change my personality they don't have long-term side effects all they do is level me out so that the the peaks and pits aren't so dramatic and that Mm -hmm. when things come on it's more palatable that's all it does for me so that's between whoever and their doctor to figure out what that right medication is what the combination but they are really necessary for a lot of people and i wish that more people wouldn't be so afraid of like the long term because also if you aren't doing well step one is to not look at it as this whole thing like 
from start of problem to end. Like you need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be your whole life? You need to look at today. Whenever you're having these issues, that's what I do. I still have days that I have down days and I have episodes, but what I do is break it up into a much shorter goal. Like you don't want to figure out the long term. Just what is in the next hour? How do you feel better? What are the steps you need to take? Who do you need to talk to? Do you need to, it sounds stupid, but like drink a glass of water, sit outside with your mm -hmm. face in the sun, figure out what the rest of the day is going to look like. Worry about the future in the future. So I think that more people would maybe turn to these solutions that could really help them their lives long term if they looked at it in that way. Yeah. So, but yeah, and OCD is a bitch. I did not know that Dude. you had it. Yeah, and I didn't realize it. I mean, my whole life, I've always made you know the joke like oh I'm so OCD I like things organized or this and that and I never realized how bad it was until I started regular therapy a little over a year ago just I had a lot of PTSD from a traumatic birth I had the miscarriage and then my whole pregnancy I was trying to stay as calm as possible but I was a little anxious I got off my I was on Wellbutrin for four years I got off any medication when I was pregnant because I just thought that was what was best for her. And then I was like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then very traumatic labor. I got help syndrome, I almost died. And then literally three days after I get home from the hospital, we start filming season nine. It was a lot and I was breastfeeding for a year so I still didn't wanna get back on any medication. But after that year of breastfeeding, I was like, okay, if I'm not ready to get back on a medication yet, I need to get in therapy. And I wanted to try EMDR therapy. So I got with an amazing therapist who specializes in that, is also a mom, and she has a lot of shared life experiences with me. So I thought she was just the perfect person. I was on a waiting list for like four months, and mm -hmm. then finally, right before we started filming, she had a spot open, and I was like, yes, amazing. I tried virtual EMDR therapy, not for me. Mm. We're talking about doing an intensive in person in San Diego soon, like an all day, the lights, the sounds and all of that. Cause I'm like, I'm not a candidate for virtual EMDR. Yeah. The talk therapy is hard enough, but it's fine because you're still having that connection. I see her face and we're getting where we need to go. But the EMDR, I hear the trash truck, my cat jumps up on me. It was just yeah. not for me. But through talk therapy about six months in, I was saying, I finally opened up for the first time about an intrusive thought I had because I'm like, this is obviously the safest place ever. She can't tell anyone if she thinks I'm crazy. She can only tell me. And I told her about my first intrusive thought I had ever opened up to someone about. And I had two. It was one where I was standing on a balcony with Summer and I just saw her falling off it. Not that I threw her, but that she jumped and just there she went. Then I was driving behind Brock and he was on his motorcycle and I just saw myself running him over, whether it was a semi that hit me and ran him over, but I just like, saw, and I was like, I don't want to harm my husband. I don't want to harm my daughter. Why are these thoughts in my head? And I was like, if I'm going to talk about it with anyone, I'm going to talk about it with my therapist. And she was like, have you ever been diagnosed with OCD? I'm like, no, but I feel my whole life like I've had it. She was like, how are you with numbers? And I was like, well, let me tell you, I follow 420 people. I have for 10 years, ever since Instagram. Like, And she was like, and then she was asking me other questions and then she sent me a questionnaire and she goes, okay, you know, it's like mild to moderate. It's not completely debilitating. It's not super severe, but this is definitely something that, you know, maybe either see a psychiatrist or your general and you might want to get on something or do some different types of therapy. So... I waited about six months. I thought, you know, like, no, I can do this on my own. I can do this on my own. And uh, I honestly think it was when the whole scandal broke that I'm dealing with betrayal of two of my nearest and dearest friends on top of court and the restraining and it was just it was so much that I was having full on mental breakdowns at home hyperventilating my daughter sees me then she starts hyperventilating and I was like this is not okay I can't be having these breakdowns at home like I need to figure this shit out and so I finally it still took me a few more months to accept that I'm like okay no you need more help than just therapy and I got on the medication and I'm definitely feeling so much better but I just had no idea that I could feel better, you know? Totally, and also it's funny for me is I, I've definitely had that my entire life, OCD. So I was only diagnosed last year, 
Mind you, though, I also have many other formal diagnoses. So I was like, add it to the fucking list. Like, but <laughs> there yeah. was a lot of peace that that brought me because it never even would have occurred to me because when you think of OCD, people say like, oh, really clean person, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And I was like a slob kebab for many years and I'm definitely more neat now. But like, for me, it was definitely intrusive thoughts and it's thoughts that get stuck on a loop, mm -hmm. which is- Yes, oh my God. It's part of what keeps me up. So I think that insomnia and OCD, which are probably the two most challenging things I deal with. And then like anxiety would be a close second feed off each other right because mm -hmm. part of the reason i'm up all night people are like why don't you just relax your brain meditate read a book well i've tried it all yeah. medication everything nothing works for me with sleep it's because i'll get stuck on thought loops and they'll keep going and going and sometimes my brain will pull from the most obscure it's not anything that's happened to me recently it wasn't even something that's necessarily super traumatic but years ago we'll just bring something up and then we'll keep it going all night long like this whole inner monologue that i'm having mm -hmm. and some some like the thoughts you were talking about Sometimes it's really gnarly, disgusting, horrible shit that I don't want to see that mm -hmm. my brain like forces me to see yeah. over and over and over. Like I had a big fear about Leo, who's my cat, who I was obsessed with, who also recently died, which was really traumatic about a month ago. He um, I was really scared about him dying all the time. So that was, you know, and then that's just how life is sometimes. But in weird ways, I would picture him being stuck in my washing machine because my washing machine opens outward, not yeah. up and down, and cats, it happens. Cats die in washing, washing machines and dryers because they like, sm they're quiet and they like places like that. So mm -hmm. like if people aren't paying attention, they'll like get in it to the point that I would not close my washing machine and start the washer until I made eye contact with Leo. I would find him in my apartment, I would close, like, close the door mm -hmm. but not turn it on, make eye contact and then turn it on. And sometimes I would make eye contact a bunch of times. Yeah. And I was like, Wow, the fact that, that never occurred to me, like, huh, this is kind of weird. Like, mm -hmm. maybe this is maybe not a normal thing you're doing. And then, like, if anyone else was doing the laundry in my apartment, I would then have to force them to have that image in their head and be mm -hmm. like, be really careful with him. And then, like, other weird little things that I know are really bizarre, some not related to him, to other people I love, things happening to me, like, just uncontrollable thoughts. So, when I found that out, it was just a big breakthrough and was like, okay, the first step is admitting you have a problem and understanding that this is what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And with my therapist, she's been very helpful in tying that specifically to different things in my childhood. Like I know exactly where that came from now mm -hmm. and how it has started and kind of gotten worse in my life, but it's definitely been a plateau in a good way of like, okay, this is the information you know now. To unlearn 32 years of that is a really challenging thing to yeah. do, but I'm up for it. And also looking at other alternative therapies besides just cognitive therapy, which is what I've been doing for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. But it's a good starting place, and I felt a lot of relief in it. And I've also found a lot of women in my life experience the same thing. So like in talking to Jordan, in talking to you, it's more common than... I think people think it is totally and that's why I like to be so open about it because you know shared life experiences just help people and know that they're not alone you know I never ever for 37 years opened up about intrusive thoughts that I've had my entire life until one session in therapy last year and I'm like why did this take me so long then I had the open conversation with my mom and then my mom tells me how bad her OCD is and now we're doing therapy together and that's just definitely helping me because between my mom Brock and I the three of us are raising summer we all need to be on the same page we all need to you know just understand what each other needs and my OCD has just been it got to the point where it was debilitating and the thoughts on a loop like mine was the dumbest final straw for me was when Ariana and I threw out the first pitch at the Padres game and I didn't throw a perfect pitch and for the entire game I just kept re-watching it but over and over and I even sent it to my mom and she was kind of like I mean yeah you know it wasn't the best and I was like oh my god oh my god now you think I did bet and it just I couldn't enjoy the game and I was like this is so stupid Sheena you just did an amazing thing you got to throw out the fucking first pitch of this game get over it you still made it over the plate he still caught the ball but I was at that point I'm like in my next therapy session, I'm gonna, you know, talk about this and then I'm getting on medication because it was just, it was too much and it was just stupid at that point. Well, and sometimes it is more trivial, trivial like that for me too. Like I, it's not always these like horrible scenarios where like someone you love is dying or whatever. Sometimes it's just really stupid shit. And then mm -hmm. I, part of it again, goes back to my attachment style, but I think everyone's mad at me all the time. I constantly have a fear of that. So I like think if I misinterpret text, I'll like, Same. I'll read, I'll, oh my re God. I'll read a sentence of a text yes. message. And I'm like, wait, they said, yeah instead of you and uh -huh. then I'm like okay what have I done wrong yep what's happened here and then I'll bring it up to them and then I obsess about it to people that are like Dana nothing is wrong what are you talking yeah. about I make up like issues in my head with every relationship yes. that I have it's like something so frustrating that I do 
or then when they respond in that way and they're like nothing's wrong then I have to obsess about the fact that I was like see nothing's wrong now they think you're crazy right? because you brought up something's wrong <laughs> and nothing's fucking wrong way. literally and then so then I have to spend the next two hours of my life dealing with that and oh, no. it is exhausting no like, the most exhausting thing I've ever dealt with mm-hmm. and I know that you do but it's just so frustrating when those things happen but again the first step you can do if you think something is up or interrupting your life is talk to anyone about it mm-hmm. even if it's not someone who is a therapist or trained clinician like starting to have these conversations because then maybe someone will spark uh, you know make a light go off in your head like oh okay maybe this is something I need to look into yeah. further you know I literally do the same thing like especially with Katie is the perfect example you know because we're re getting into being friends again and just relearning where we are in life and what we need from a friendship and all of this and we're in a very great place we had a little dinner date just the two of us the other night emo night everything like we're having so much fun together but prior to that you know if I would text her and she didn't respond right I'm like oh my god wait did I say something on a podcast is she upset with me wait hold on and I'm like racking my brain of like why isn't she and I'm like no she's just bad at responding it's okay she doesn't it's not just you but I would have to talk myself off a ledge too because I get so many scenarios in my head of like why isn't she responding she hates me we're not we're not friends again she no she's mad at me I did something it's like oh my god I'll give you a great example on the way here I was five minutes late I'm I am the most psychotically punctual person alive. I'm 20 minutes early to everything. If I'm not, I'm always like, I'm in a car accident. Like something terrible is happening. Yeah. So I texted you on the way and like, hey, I'm five minutes late, whatever. And you said, um, no worries, just parked. And you didn't say like any exclamation points or any emojis or whatever. And you are so like, you're very responsive and you always do a bunch of exclamation points. So I literally looked at it like three times. And I was like, wait, I thought you were going to say like, no worries at all. And I was like, she just said no worries and then no exclamation point or anything. And I was like, God, I bet she's mad. I literally did that on the way here. And I was oh like, my okay, God. I'm almost there. Sorry. And I'm like, why would anyone be mad over five minutes? It's fucking no, fine. I like, but I still had to do that. Right. And I read into the fact of like how you, and by the way, these people you're having these issues with in your head have no idea this is going on yeah. for you when they're just like having normal text messages. But now or, that I do know that, I will be more aware to put an exclamation <laughs> no, or a kissy face or something. It's a fucking <laughs> me problem. But yeah, it's But like, I'm the same way. So I completely understand that. I relate to that. I do. And it, sound, it sounds like, well, Dana, it doesn't sound like you've made much progress. I really have. And the biggest thing is just knowing that it's there and what it is. So at least you can recognize it. And like, I do catch myself now when I'm spiraling of being like, okay, this is still hard. My brain is difficult to stop when I'm doing this. But at least I'm aware, hey, take a step back. This is probably rational, right? Like this whole thing is probably just happening for you and it's one sided and um, no one's probably going to stick your cat in a laundry machine. Mm -hmm. And like it's, it's just easier to at least take a step back and be like, okay, I'm at this level. If I can get to this level, that's a better place to start because each time, like I, Gabby Bernstein, who I talk about all the time, she's oh, love her. obsessed with her. Yeah. Um, in her book, I think it was Happy Days or one of them. Um, she talks about like these, this like level of 20 emotions and basically whatever the worst one, it's like anger or whatever. It's she basically talks about the same thing. Instead of trying to get from 20 to one, why don't you get from 20 to 19? So it's mm. like neutrality feels better than rage, depression, sadness, any like extreme emotion. So if it's not about feeling good, it's about getting to a place where you can aim to start working toward good. But it's unrealistic sometimes when you're in those spirals and those moments to get from 20 to one. Why don't you get just a few steps ahead? Mm-hmm. Because that still feels better. And that'll still be an easier place for you to start continuing to move forward. But yeah. it's just not realistic to like go from one to the other. So I need to go back steps. and audio book some of her stuff I think it was called super attractor actually maybe that was in super attractor I also told you to read universe has your back when we first yes. met and was like this book has changed my life and you're yeah. like I don't like to read but you have been listening to audiobooks yeah Love it. it's just so like a podcast I need to go back to that yeah. because I remember there was one chapter where she was talking about how comparison is just like the devil and that's something that is so hard on this show in this industry who has more followers who gets better brand deals who like the comparison where it's like we're all different we're all our own brand but it is so hard sometimes to not compare yourself, you know? Oh, comparison is a thief of joy. Ugh. And by the way, everyone has different metrics to what success looks like in their life. Mm-hmm. So you're basing it off whatever works for you, whereas they're over there looking at your life doing the same thing. It's just an interesting, that's something that I've really reconciled recently because I am so blessed. And also, if you look for blessings in your life, they're going to continue to appear. But mm-hmm. if you're looking at everything from a place of I don't have enough and your cup isn't full like nothing is going to progress for you in the way that you want it to so I always try to start there but like 
everyone has different blessings and everyone has different deficits. And when you try to compare, when you're looking at the lens of your own life, you're going to fail. Mm-hmm. There's no way to come out of that being like, oh, I feel good about the scroll I just did on that person's Instagram uh, dissecting all the things that they have that I don't <laughs> like. I feel better. Like, no, yeah. you don't. You no. feel worse. Go take a fucking walk. Go outside. Like, yeah. what are you doing right now? That so. is literally what Brock and I have been doing to reset. We take summer out. We've made up our own song. It kind of plays off the bear hunt song, but it's like, we're going on a squirrel hunt. We're da, da, da. And we just go outside. We go look for squirrels. We feed them some crackers and some nuts. And it's just like, I don't have my phone on me unless I'm taking a cute video of her. But that's just our little reset. If she's having her terrible two tantrum, I'm like, you want to go find squirrels? You want to go see some birds? Let's go find the neighborhood cat. And it's just like, for all of us, is just a good reset just to get out in a little bit of nature and just not worry about the other shit. Do you know what I've been doing lately? Okay, so emo night, part of this for me of why I love it so much is anything that is inner child work for me is very healing and feels yeah. very therapeutic. So like last year I learned how to play tennis because I just didn't get to do tennis lessons growing up and I'm currently looking for a piano teacher just because I just really want to learn piano. I've never gotten to do it. I've been roller skating and I've been having the Ooh. time of my fucking life. I got my own pair of skates. I've been, my friend took me to a rink. She's like really good at it. I was able to like skate backwards. Like I have that figured out, but like just things that are fun and stupid and I don't give a fuck how I look I'm like out there with a bunch of eight-year-olds I don't care it's really fun to me that's what I like to spend my time doing just like more activities like that so whatever it is if it's a squirrel song if it's roller skating if it's scuba diving and almost getting eaten by a shark (laughs) whatever it is but like just constantly like we all have inner child shit that needs to be worked on and so it's just like more lighthearted things everything is so heavy these days and especially with social media which I am a part of contributing to so are you like we're all on it we all make this culture but like whatever you can do to feed yourself offline is 10 out of 10 recommend yeah I had never really done any inner child work until right before I got I think it was in between the miscarriage and my pregnancy with summer and I did a Reiki session for the first time and she was like out of nowhere I'm, I've never even really talked about this she didn't know anything about the show or anything like that but at the end of the session she goes so I spent a lot of time with your 12 year old self today and out of I'm I don't know 35 36 at the time but I'm like out of every year of life if you could have chosen why did you pick 12 like how did she know that that was the absolute worst year of my life where I woke up every day and just wished I was dead but would never have been suicidal and actually killed myself because I didn't have the balls to do that and I just was in such a bad place I was getting bullied so bad I didn't open up to my mom about it I didn't want anyone to know but 12 was the absolute worst year of my life and she was like I really spent a lot of time with her today and I was like oh my God, that 12-year-old kid does still live inside of me. And then I had someone recently on Patreon reach out and said, you know, I feel like the reason why you rode so hard for Raquel is literally taking care of that like little yeah. child inside of you. And I'm like, that's so true. That's why I was so ride or die for that girl because I'm like, I know what it feels like to be totally. that. And like, I want to help you because no one helped me, but no one knew at the same time. Totally. And I mean, that was a really mind blowing thing for me, too. And that's what that was. My like, I'm really protective. And my therapist was like, yeah, because you were protected at certain times of your, you know, developmental life that you really needed that. Mm -hmm. She had me write a letter to a version of myself when I was younger. And like, what would you say if that little girl was sitting in the room with you? What would you say to her? Like, how much would you apologize and hug her and tell her how sorry you were? Like those things happened and like go easy on her. And that was like really fucking mind-blowing to me and was a big moment of healing and moving forward like it's just so crazy when I see my niece or you see your daughter now like Mm -hmm. the way that you would talk to them why can't we talk to ourselves that way and realize that that still lives inside of us those wounds are there and it's not too late to it's not the same thing but it's not too late to tend to them yourself yeah there's something really powerful about that totally what all kinds of therapy have you done have you done EMR I know you talked about I think it was called TMS so TMS, um, so I'm probably going to do it this summer. It was I because I was figuring out if I was going to do the six, like you had talked about the week intensive course. Mm-hmm. There's a week intensive, but it's literally 10 hours a day, Monday through Friday. Mm-hmm. And then there was one that was six weeks. And I think I'm going to do the intensive. So mostly just cognitive therapy, but I looked into um, DBT and other ones as well. But I think TMS is probably the best fit for me. Yeah. So I'm really excited to do what that. What is that exactly? So TMS is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. So they basically map your brain and they find the areas of your brain that are both underperforming and overperforming. So for me, 
my anxiety response and my brain is over producing that my when depression happens it's on my brain is underperforming and being able to like regulate serotonin and things like that so they map your brain and then they hook you up to this big machine it's basically like a really low dose of mri which sounds scary but it's fda approved there's been no side effects and people my therapist also was like i think this is the best one for you the things that you are would be going to seek a solution for it's had the best results for in terms of insomnia ocd mm-hmm. depression anxiety um so yeah i'm really excited about that and that there are so many other options mm-hmm. than there used to be when it used to just be talk therapy and then before right. talk therapy it was no one talked about anything so i think we've continued to get better and i'm really excited to move forward with it yeah well i'm excited for you too and i feel like we could literally talk for another hour hey we can so, come we'll do more episodes i think Let's we talk need about to it all. Yeah. yeah speaking of more episodes i hear you have a podcast coming out ha- yes uh, me and katie have been working on that so right now we are figuring out ironing out where we're gonna land but i'm hoping that that will be out in the next two months or so love that so working on that i'm really excited i did a podcast like off the cuff in yeah. 2020 the wine just, with me yeah just, yeah well so that was on instagram but i had one called unfuck with the bowl that was oh, just yeah, like yeah. fun to do and mm-hmm. it was kind of a whatever and then when i started working it just like i just didn't have time because i was doing it all myself but yeah have been dying to do that i love podcasting love that you had me on today and in general i'm just like super excited about it and i would love to have you back for sure hell this yeah was so good Thank you so much for getting into some shenanigans with me, finally. Thank I'm you for so having... glad we did this. And also, we don't just have to talk about mental illness. We can also be fun. So we yeah. have other like, fun things to talk about. Agreed. But yes, thank you so much for having me. Yes. Love you. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. I've been searching for this all my life. You're just my type. I've been looking for a boy who can treat me right. Your dark hair because I so bright. They look into my soul and it sparks my life. Can I take you there?